Hello, everyone, and welcome to the July 2018 community meeting of the ITB2 Transmark Foundation. This is Rudy Potenzone. This is the agenda for today. We'll start with a welcome from Diane. Review uh, of the June meeting that we just completed at Harvard a few weeks ago. Talk about our fall meeting that's coming up in Geneva uh, in uh, the end of October. Uh, look at some of the new things that have been uh, coming to, uh, for our sponsors programs and then have presentations from the ETL working group and the user interface working group. This is being recorded as usual and the recording will be available on our website along with the slide deck. Diane? Thank you, Rudy, um, and uh, welcome everyone. Um, so thanks for um, thanks for joining in the, uh, the middle of summer. I hope everybody's uh, enjoying their summertime um, because it goes fast. Okay, so um, again, happy summer. Um, I just wanted to remind um, folks, we did have a board election um, recently, and um, this is a list of uh, our board of directors. The, um, the, the folks listed in bold are um, either newly elected or re-elected to the board. Um, the, the board election is um, every spring, so, um, so that, that's something that we do uh, every year. The, and also a reminder, the, the members um, are the, the, the ones that nominate um, the uh, board of directors. Um, and so that group, the members group, is actually coming up for um, another uh, election in the fall. So if you're a member and you want to um, invite additional um, folks onto the uh, the membership group um, that will be coming up um, so stay tuned for that we want to kind of get that done before the Geneva conference so probably around the September time frame you'll be hearing about that right, next slide so I think um, for those of you who attended the Harvard meeting um, this year you can flip to the next slide Rudy uh, I, I've, I've been attending this, um, the I2B2 uh, academic user group meeting from the beginning. Uh, and uh, last year was the first year that we had a combined meeting between I2B2 and Transmart. And I, I, I personally, I think this was the, the best um, meeting um, ever. Uh, it, um, it really was two days. One was a, a high level speakers. We had a, a number of keynote speakers that um, I think brought a lot of interesting um, topics to the, um, the table. I think people enjoyed that. Um, the second day was um, really a targeted workshops, and I got a lot of really, really great feedback from um, that, that day. A lot of energy. People were able to really speak up and, and, um, and, and you know, learn information um, that, that hopefully will help them. So that was exciting. We had about 160 people attending the conference with um, 20 people um, attending um, via um, GoToMeeting. So I, I, I think it was a, a, a really uh, big success. Um, this is just a list of some of the keynote speakers for the first day, um, you know, high level folks that, that um, were really interesting and, um, and, and uh, fun to listen to. And then the second day, go to the next slide, Rudy. The second day, just to remind people, so we, we had working group sessions um, for our working groups, ETL ontologies and the user interface. Um, I do have to say that right after the conference, um, we had you know, an onslaught of uh, additional people joining the working group. So that was really, um, that was really great to see. We had a great session on data governance and data delivery. There were three separate hospitals that, uh, that participated in that. Um, I said it sat in on that one, and I think people were really, really excited. I really encouraged the, the speakers, the three speakers, to um, you know submit uh, a, a something for an upcoming AMIA because I think this is a super hot topic and something that people struggle with um, around their their I two B two implementation. So that was great. Um, ACT had a full day session from ten to four, and it, you know. People, there was a lot of buzz around that. I think people really learned a lot, and I think that was a, a hugely valuable um, and well-attended um, session. And then the last one was the I2B2 um, uh, Transmart platform um, working session, and that was that was that was really neat. Uh, Paul Aviak and his folks um, had separate breakout st stations with different um, topics, and 
you know, people could, could people could bring in their laptops and, you know, install the new update and really um, sit there and work with the developers um, on, you know, what's happening. So I, I think this one, we want to, I think we want to really, really, you know, expand on that in, in um, at future conferences. So you can go to the next slide, Rudy. Um, of course, I want to thank again our sponsors. Um, you know, we uh, they they pay for the the conference. Um, they pay for the the venue, the food, um, and, and everything. So really, um, kudos to to these um, these folks that um, that supported us. Very important. So next slide. Um, so this is this is I think this is my last slide. So um, all of the materials, all of the slide decks, and most of the sessions were actually recorded as well. So the slide decks are uh, for the most part available on our website, and the recordings are um, in the process and will be um, available soon. So please, if, if folks weren't um, able to attend all the sessions and are interested in um, in picking up certain talk, talks, please let them know that this resource is, is there. Um, I think this is hugely uh, valuable, um, and I want to really make sure you know people um, people know about this. So that was the the Harvard meeting. And next slide, I think. Um, and Rudy, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn it over to you. Okay, thanks, Dan. So the fall meeting uh, is scheduled for October 31st and November 1st uh, in Geneva. It's going to be at Campus Biotech, a, a very lovely conference space um, that uh, has been booked. Um, <clears throat> Jean-Louis Louis Rosario was at uh, the meeting at Harvard and presented uh, a set of slides, which I'll show now. Uh, and him and Christoph are the key organizers. Um, there's still time to submit um, uh, presentations uh, for the program uh, and also you should be registering now as, as well uh, there's probably about I don't know 70 people registered already uh, this is their sixth European I2B2 academic users meeting uh, and the second time that the foundation uh, will be working with them uh, on this meeting um, originally it, it has said that the registration closes closes on July 15th but um, that was really intended to try to encourage people to, to register so that their the planners could have more time. Uh, but certainly we have another month or so uh, to, to, to get yourself registered, but now would be a good time to register if you, uh, if you are planning to come. Uh, some of the topics, the key topics that uh, they're hoping to, to cover are uh, identity management, um, management of information within uh, our platforms, uh, drilling down in ontologies and semantics, uh, et cetera. Uh, privacy and security within I2B2 and Transmart, especially with the new European GDPR uh, compliance rules, uh, and then also clinical outcomes. Um, we really uh, like to focus, and we also we always get a lot of strong feedback uh, when we do sessions on the actual applications of I2B2 uh, and Transmart, and we're hoping to have some some good um, presentations uh, on on those uh, at this meeting. Four keynotes that are already uh, set up are with uh, Sean Murphy is going to be coming across to do uh, a presentation um, uh, about I2B2. Uh, Dr. Ger Geraldine Vink from the, uh, the Netherlands, the uh, Cancer Institute of the Netherlands uh, is going to be presenting. Uh, Professor Ulrich Sachs uh, will be also speaking. He's also a board member of the foundation. And then from uh, Paul VX group, Jason Stedman will be coming to talk about the I2B2 Transmart platform and give us an update uh, on how that's going. <clears throat> there will be uh, a dinner on the uh, on a, a boat. So uh, we will all load up in the boat and go for a dinner now um, in order to, you know, because of the, the cost, uh, this will be a shared cost, um, but um, it promises to be quite an elegant uh, evening out uh, on Lake Geneva. Uh, Zach Kahani told us a story that um, when, uh, when he was young and graduating uh, from high school, I believe, that uh, his class went out on this boat um, for uh, their cruise. So um, one of the highlights of the, of the week. Uh, as I say, it's still time to, um, to submit contributions if you want to be a presenter. 
Uh, we are using a, a tool called Easy Chair. Uh, these links are all on the website on the, um, the Geneva Conference page. Um, but um, it, please uh, take a look. Uh, the details of the conference uh, are, are there and being expanded um, as we get more information. Uh, and to help us plan, it'd be great. Uh, if you want to come, if you want to do a presentation, now would be a super time to uh, actually get your application and get your proposals in. This is the Scientific Program Committee. Uh, a lot of these folks have been doing this for a number of years for the academic user group meeting. Uh, but as I say, we are also working closely with them now to um, have an expanded program. So um, we look forward to uh, you're, you're attending to this meeting and um, please uh, register uh, as, as soon as you can. So I'm going to uh, switch a little bit and talk um, shortly, briefly about the uh, sponsors program. Uh, we've been uh, working, the, the board, our board of directors have been working closely with us to uh, put together a couple of new sponsors programs. Um, and, and right now there are three that are uh, fairly active. Um, Zach, our chairman of our board, uh, announced the contributing sponsors program uh, at the Harvard meeting. Uh, this is really designed for academic groups uh, and nonprofit organizations who are users of the platform and just want to give some, some financial support to the foundation. Our corporate sponsors program is designed for both corporate users and potentially vendors uh, who want to help support um, the, the, um, the work of the foundation. And then um, we do event sponsorships uh, as appropriate uh, for each event that we have. So for example, the, the Harvard meeting was fully funded by the sponsors um, of that meeting. Uh, the contributing sponsors program, uh, there's a set of benefits here uh, that shows that we're anticipating future uh, conferences are probably, you know, we're probably gonna have to charge for them uh, and so contributing sponsors will get two free tickets. Uh, we're working to, you know, and part of this program is to give early access to uh, our development roadmaps and, and get participation uh, from the sponsors, um, get, you know, some higher priority with their, their tickets of, of, of uh, uh, defects and problems and requests. Um, and then uh, also uh, further, um, you know, acknowledgement of their support uh, for the foundation. Um, what what are these what all these sponsorship programs support? Well, all the activities of the foundation, you know, just the administrative uh, stuff. It all it all costs money. We have to pay for subscriptions to uh, just go to meeting, go to webinar. Um, our website, you know, costs money. Uh, all the different uh, things that we do, um, and so in supporting um, all the the outreach programs that we have. Uh, uh, this is all part of the administrative overhead. Also, the project management committees, um, keeping you know the the Jira system and keeping the various um, activities where you know the the PMCs um, are trying to you know to to maintain uh, the the source code. We we organize the the, um, the the releases, do the release management. We do the um, um, uh, Defect tracking and, and QA, you know, organizing the QA and all that takes some time and effort, um, as well as you know maintaining the website and you know the support for the, the working groups, et cetera. So these are the kinds of activities that um, you know we we are we, we've pared back uh, as as far as we possibly can in terms of these costs, um, but still there are costs to actually you know run the foundation. So um, We'd like to the, the cost per year for a, to be a contributing sponsor is five thousand um, dollars per uh, group or organization, and we're excited to say that we've got five uh, four um, uh, contributing sponsors already: uh, the University of Michigan uh, Medical School uh, the Medicine Group, um, Gil Oman, our uh, former chairman of the board and a board member, uh, was the first to to sign up for the program immediately. Uh, prognosis data uh, is also a, a contributing member and we get the, a tremendous amount of support from partners healthcare uh, and dbmi so we're delighted to have these folks all part of our new contributing sponsors program um, in addition we've put together a corporate sponsors program uh, similar uh, but um, uh, uh, 
maybe you know trying to to focus it more on on commercial customers uh, again though looking at the people who are using the product and also vendors uh, and looking for their support to help the the foundation um, continue to um, to to do the support that we do. Uh, this has uh, different uh, levels um, for the sponsorship and depending on the size of the, the company. Uh, and so um, something to consider if you're in a company or you're in an academic organization, this is a way for you to help support the foundation and uh, keep you know keep all of our activities moving ahead. Uh, so, uh, and, and as I say, you know, the, um, the, the sponsorships are really focused on, you know, the, the different uh, aspects. Uh, we also have event sponsorships, as I said, and this is more focused on the vendors. So the, the, we had um, one vendor, Axiomatics, uh, was was actually took advantage of all the, the benefits uh, and had a table and were able to do demonstrations and things at the meeting, but also several of the other vendors, uh, Google Education, um, uh, et cetera, you know, we're at the, the meeting and we're able to give presentations, um, uh, Trinetics, uh, they gave presentations and so they had some good exposure, we think. Um, not all events will have sponsorships, but those that do, um, you know, will, this will be available. So that's what I wanted to talk about on terms of the uh, the agenda, I mean, the, uh, the new uh, sponsorship programs and we're happy to answer some questions at the end uh, as we go. Uh, now we're going to switch a little bit and uh, Mike Mendez, who's the chairman of the ETO working group, is going to um, describe this for us. So Mike, are you there? Uh, yes, I'm here. Okay. <laughs> okay. You want to flip to the next page? Yep. Okay. Oh, you made it uh, pretty. <laughs> I dressed it up a little. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so actually we had a really great breakout session. Uh, there was a good attendance. Um, we basically kind of talked about three different main, main things. Like we talked about some ETL, existing ETL tools, some best practices, and then we talked a little bit about some EHR systems. Um, I'm going to be uh, posting the, uh, um, the PowerPoints so uh, you'll be able to see if you weren't unable to attend. Also, I noticed that a bunch of new people have signed up, which is great. Uh, but basically, we talked about, like in the ETL tools, we talked about like the existing kettle and then the various different uh, PM, PM lo uh, data loader and transmot batch to load data into the transmot. Uh, but then we also talked about SSIS, which could be used for both uh, transmot or ITP2. Um, for best practices, this is Loading data in, we talked about using like uh, stored procedures, uh, not stored procedures, uh, database views to uh, uh, create various different projects. Um, how do we deal with local codes, uh, which was a intense discussion of like labs and uh, medications. Uh, like, so a lot of institutions have their own coding system, but they're not linked to like Rx Norm or NDC, but they have their own. So there's discussion about using uh, like some of the NIH APIs to extract the data and determine it. Uh, using full versus partial data loads, uh, it, uh, the main consensus was most people were using full data loads. So, and then we also talked a little bit about the multi-fact table and in regards to the genomics. And then we talked about the various different EHR systems, Epic, Allscripts, NextGen, Cerner, and kind of how they uh, have doing some mapping of uh, their data to transmit slash ITB2, okay? Um, so next screen. Okay, so, so then we also talked about future stuff. So we updated the uh, wiki site to uh, reflect some of the uh, discussions and open discussions uh, that happened. Uh, we're ongoing looking at ways of loading genomic data into ITB2 and Transmon. Uh, we're leveraging some of the existing uh, ways that the Biobank has done it and other people have done uh, loading genomics and trying to figure out a way to have Lots of patients in the ITB2 Transmont found a uh, platform, but yet have the genomic data also, because it starts to uh, balloon very quickly when you have patients. 
for example, if you had 30,000 patients and you loaded all the uh, genomic data for each of those patients, which is 1.7 billion, uh, 1.7 million rows per patient, it turns into 34 billion records, and that's only with 30,000 patients. So once you add 100,000, then you're going into big data, and then maybe we need to look at other uh, database platforms for this. Um, we also are adding content for best practices. Um, we also talked about creating some type of like ETL package that could be used for both I2B2 and Transmod, uh, and then creating tutorials for using some of the tools. And then there was also talk about some, like basically a checklist, uh, maybe just an Excel checklist that we can just get out that basically these are the steps that you need to do. Um, maybe uh, it would have like, okay, some QA stuff on it. So uh, last month you had 1.5 million patients. 51% uh, were female and 49 were male. But then this uh, month you have only 1 million patients and there's 100% female. So then you'll, you'll realize, oh, this something happened in our ETL process that we should not have lost half uh, 500,000 patients and also all the males somehow weren't there. So uh, ways of just kind of doing a checklist or something. Uh, so that was, uh, so that's future stuff that we were looking at. Uh, we're also open to other ideas. Uh, anyone who wants to join the ETL group, uh, I, you can go to that wiki page and then um, you can join us. We have a call every, uh, uh, Tuesday, uh, uh, the first Tuesday of every month. So we're having one on the 6th. And so uh, look forward to seeing new faces. Thanks. Thanks, Rudy. Okay. Thanks, Mike. All right. Um, now we'll switch to uh, Griffin, going to talk about the user interface working group. Griffin? Yes. Hello. Thank you. Um, I'm chair of the ITBT Transmart User Interface Working Group. I'm going to switch this slide. Okay. So first on logistics, um, I'm chair. I'm from more of the ITBT side of things. I have a co-chair, Joachim Ballard from The Hive, who represents the Transmart community. Right now, we've got a dozen members from both ITB2 and Transmart um, user groups. Uh, we usually meet monthly on the third Wednesday at 12 o'clock Eastern time. Uh, I think we have a next meeting tomorrow, actually. Uh, that usually because it's a, it's a small group and if too many of us are absent, we may cancel or reschedule. I think as the, as the topics solidify and we get more people, um, we may uh, be more regular on the meeting dates. Um, join our user groups. There are no requirements. You can just listen in if you want. Uh, from the June meeting, I think a lot of people are just curious of where we're going with things. We also have a, a wiki site where we're posting content. Next slide. So the goals are our group. Like the other working groups, we have no funding. So we are not building any new user interfaces. Um, what we're actually doing is three different things. First is just understanding the UI differences between all the different various versions of I2B2 and Transmart that are out there. One of the first things we realized as we came together is uh, people from the I2B2 community had little knowledge of what the Transmart platform actually does, and similarly, Transmart users haven't um, seen a lot of the latest features that are available in I2B2. So we're just sort of catching up on what exists, and then there are a bunch of separate efforts going on right now to design new UIs and um, uh, build on top of um, new APIs that are now available. Our second goal is learning how similar programs have addressed their UI challenges. So ITB3 and Transmart aren't the only tools that can build complex queries. So many other platforms for clinical research data, as well as just in general, how do database pro software programs and other programs handle some of the types of visualization. And third is, to identify and maybe help coordinate some of these ongoing efforts that I just mentioned about. Next slide. So we've had several meetings so far. The first ones were doing some in-depth walkthroughs of 
what I2B2 and Transmart look like out of the box. Um, when an institution actually installs it and productionalizes it, there's also often lots of customizations that happen. We also did some demos of what um, I2B2 really looks like at uh, my institution, Beth Digital Deaconess Medical Center, as well as Transmart University of Michigan. Uh, sometimes people add functionality um, to the existing software, and sometimes people remove functionality. Sometimes there are features in these tools that are not really relevant to the particular types of data that are being loaded in or um, policies at an institution. So there's sort of additions and deletions that happen to user interfaces when they're actually put into production. And so we've seen some previews of some of the newer things coming out, in particular with the high score layer user interface. Next slide. So the, at the June meeting, uh, we reviewed a little bit about what the uh, working group does, but primarily what we did was we had, a, we had a large audience there, a lot of people who are not normally part of the working group, and we're trying to get ideas of what people would like us to be discussing at our future meetings. Um, since, that, since the June meeting, I've gone through them and grouped them into sort of four buckets. Um, the first one is low-hanging fruit, just sort of collecting some information about bugs people have discovered recently in user interfaces, for example, some few different issues in the IT timeline. Are there some minor tweaks that we can do to the existing interfaces that can um, have a big effect on usability? Um, the Shrine web client is fairly similar to the standard ITB2 web client and can be seen just be merged. And then um, there's some other ongoing user interface efforts, in particular some uh, prototypes of Dana Farber Cancer Institute has done. The second one is some drill downs into building queries. So each of these may be separate whole meetings that we have. Um, one is a drill down into modifiers, um, how it works currently in ITB2 and some alternative methods the Hive and others are looking into. Uh, there's a new simple temporal query builder in ITB2. Um, so uh, it is a big improvement over the the previous one, but there may be other ways of further improving it. Uh, right now, we don't have this really in ICD2, but um, how what would it look like if we wanted to start defining sort of uh, family relationships, like being able to identify siblings or parent-child relationships in our data set, and then querying for things other than patients, in particular if you want to search for specimens or, um, or clinical encounters. Third one is data quality and data insights. This was an interesting discussion. People came up with a lot of uh, uh, um, important things in this area. One are sort of concepts and being able to query for health services and healthcare utilization, things like fact counts um, or uh, distance to hospitals, number of visits patients had. There's a lot of things in here that are really important when you're working with observational health data. Um, being able to get some additional information about ontology items. So are there known items in your ontology that have good or poor quality? What are the counts by year? Um, I know some institutions have done some customizations um, to display some of this, but can this be brought into the standard user interfaces? Better use of timeline for the data insights and population synopsis. What this means is um, when users are querying um, these large data sets, electronic health record or claims data sets, they don't really have a good understanding of what the underlying data looks like. So are there tools we can do to show them um, sort of the complexities of the data, where the quality problems or missing data lie, and help them better interpret the results of their queries? Um, and then when you expand this out to federated queries, uh, being able to see differences across different sites in data quantity and quality across a consortium. And then finally, some general functionality issues um, like login, localization, uh, when you use ITV2 in different languages, and what APIs or functionality would need to be built on the back end in order to support some new user interface features. So our next meeting of the user group will be going into these topics in more depth and trying to prioritize them and put out an agenda, and we'll eventually post on our wiki page uh, a list of future meetings with which topic we'll be covering. At the June meeting, um, people noted that they may not be interested in all of these things, so they would they maybe prefer to attend individual meetings based on their preferences. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Kevin. <clears throat>
<clears throat> okay, so we'd like to open up for uh, questions and discussion. Uh, any any of the topics and all that we've covered, uh, we're happy to talk about. I think Diane is still here and Mike and, and Griffin. Um, also, uh, just a uh, note that we've actually had a couple of registrations for Geneva and a couple of people requesting joining the working groups while the session's been going. So if you have interest there, um, please, um, please do um, visit the website. If you have a question, uh, you have a couple of ways you can raise your hand. You can type a question into the question window, uh, or you can put a question in the chat chat window. So, if you have any questions, please um, let me know now. I'm not seeing any. Okay. Well, uh, this um, the recording of this will be posted. Uh, oh, just a note on the uh, UI user group, uh, the working group meeting. Uh, we did record that that working group uh, and have the slide deck, and those are being posted uh, as we speak. Diane, would you like to say any closing comments? Just um, to thank everyone. Um, and also, if, for the folks that uh, uh, attended the conference at Harvard, if um, you have not filled out a survey, we, we'd still love to to get your um, your feedback about the um, the conference, either through the survey or you could, you know, just email us directly um, would be great. Because we we want to hear what you uh, what you thought. Other than that, have a wonderful summer, and we'll talk to you next month. Thank you.